OK, brilliant. So thank you, everyone. Oops. Yeah, thank you, everyone um, uh, for joining us. And um, I so as I mentioned, I'm Sarah Ty Ford. Uh, I'm the Corporate Equality Manager for the Council. And I am also um, the lead officer and main contact for the equality, sorry, the interpreting and translation framework um, for the council. Uh, and I have responsibility sort of across the board for the other partners in the um, uh, in the framework as well. OK, so the aim, sorry, and I should run through this. I have run through this, but just we'll be recording the session, microphones off and the chat functions uh, and the hand raising functions are marked there. So please do use those as we go through. So the purpose of the session today is to explain the structure of East Sussex County Council for people who are not familiar with it. Um, particularly focusing on the areas that are the biggest users of interpreting and translation services. Um, we're also going to explain in detail some of our um, services and provide information that hopefully will help you when you're working with your staff, with our staff and service users. Um, and just to note that this session isn't actually about the framework itself. Um, we won't be answering questions about that here unless they're really, really urgent. Um, there's another meeting. There's the provider forum meeting coming up um, in future. So this uh, meeting is specifically just to explain um, the council, how it works to help inform and support you. OK. Let me just check because I think there's some people waiting to come in. OK. So uh, introductions, as I said, uh, I've, I've noted who I am. Atia and um, Sarah and Kaveri have all introduced themselves. And so just to run through then that the. I'll be explaining the overarching council structure of all the directorates. Then I'll give a brief overview of the three directorates that I work with. Then I'll pass over to Sarah and Atia, who will explain their services. So we'll run through the whole of the council. There's a lot to get through, but um, hopefully it will all make sense as, as it goes through. So East Sussex County Council is divided into five main directorates. And I will just run through this. So communities, economy and transport is responsible for the community services like libraries, registrars, the registration service that looks after births, deaths and marriages and, and other um, services, customer access, roads, transport planning, economy and the East Sussex environment. So very, very wide and diverse remit. Business services is responsible for managing finance, uh, information technology, human resources, procurement and property. So a sort of a, a support function within that directorate. Governance services provides advice, as it sounds, on the governance of the council, including legal and constitutional arrangements. It's also where the policy team sits and the communications team. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a moment. Then we'll look at uh, also children's services, which provide social care for people under 16, state education and other childcare services. And then adult social care and health provide social care services for residents over 16, including residential care and sensory care services. And within that falls the, the health aspect, the public health remit. OK, so in terms of my three directorates that I support, communities, economy and transport is um, one. Um, and as you can see, that falls into um, three main areas, some of which will have more impact or more need in relation to interpreting and translating than others. So um, the communities area includes libraries, archives in the keep, registration, as I've mentioned, customer services, digital inclusion, trading standards, work with gypsies and travellers and liaison with those communities, road safety and emergency planning. Um, here is where I think we may have um, some need, some specific need, a regular need for interpreting and translation, uh, particularly around the registration service. Um, that could be around um, understanding legal requirements and that kind of thing, but also customer services, which includes complaints. And also there are issues around planning and in the centre of are there sort of parking as well. So possibly some kinds of consultation exercises um, that may need translation of materials or uh, interpreting for sort of live events. 
So that middle chunk there is operations and contracts. Uh, and as its notes, it's parking, transport, rights of way, countryside management, waste, refuge, uh, um, not the collection, but the sort of the managing of waste uh, once it comes into us. Um, assets, council assets, council properties uh, and, and buildings and lands that the council owns. And then the commercial um, aspects of the council uh, in terms of areas we've got responsibility for. And then the third area for this directorate is its economy. So economic skills and development, infrastructure for planning and place, major projects and growth. Um, so big uh, investment uh, in um, building development. Eastbourne Town Centre would be a good example of that. Um, culture, employability and skills, planning policy, transport development, flood risk and the, the wider environment. So again, some things like employability and skills where we're trying to sort of develop, develop um, adult skills, particularly um, people who are not in employment, education or training. So there will be some areas here. This directorate has not very frequently used interpreting and translation in the past. Um, and I, I'm working with staff to ensure that they understand the importance of this provision and how to book when it's needed. So this could, could be an area that we, we see some development in. OK. Business services. Um, now, as I noted, this is much more of a sort of an internal type department um, focused on supporting staff to fulfil our roles in the council. Uh, and this covers things like property, so county halls, St Mary's, all the various different buildings around the county that the council uh, owns, works from and where services are delivered from. Um, and ensuring that they're accessible, uh, that they meet health and safety standards, all that kind of thing, um, but that they work for staff and service users. Finance and procurement, um, so how we commission services and how we um, do fair processes in terms of um, allocations of budgets uh, and, and paying for um, the services that we don't provide ourselves. Human resources and organisational development. Uh, obviously very much focused on staff, learning and development, um, health and well-being, um, that kind of thing. Internal audit, which is the process of checking that the council is follow following processes that are nationally or locally set. And then information uh, technology um, and um, all the sort of the computers technology that we need. So I think that this generally will not be requiring very much translation interpreting. The big difference will be uh, in human resources, particularly where there are perhaps recruitment processes where somebody needs an interpreter, where this is a reasonable adjustment, for example, for a, a deaf applicant for a council job. So that wouldn't be directly through um, human resources necessarily, but it might be through that job application process. Um, but again, we'll be keeping track on this and identifying whether there are areas that have not used those services in the past, but may need to use them more in the future. Okay. Governance services, this is the last of my three um, areas. Um, this again, very much a sort of an internal focus on supporting council staff, uh, much less about residents or outside customers. Um, but when we look at these areas, if we look at communications, policy, so uh, that's that's looking at uh, what changes are happening in national government or in national strategies and applying them to the local context. Legal services, um, very much about where there are, um, th th this would support things like planning, but also where there are sort of complaints or that kind of thing, or where we need to be making decisions about allocations of funding, um, decisions on members' behaviour and that kind of thing. So a whole range of things come under legal services. Performance research and intelligence supports us with data and with information and monitoring what we're doing to ensure that we're meeting targets, setting the right targets and meeting them. And then member services is around our elected councillors. Um, so all the individuals from across the county who are um, elected um, periodically and then represent both their particular areas and the county as a whole um, and how we support them, how we ensure that they're a diverse range of people. Uh, whole range of work around them. So there are areas in that you can see some communications may need to be translated. Um, COVID-19 information was a really good example of that, where actually it was vitally important that people had access to the right information in, in the languages that they could understand. Um, 
also potentially around member services, either for a, a member themselves, uh, if English is not their first language, but probably more likely, um, given the, the skills and the, the level of literacy that members need for all the paperwork that they read, possibly more in terms of their work with, with um, local residents where they might actually need um, access to an interpreter or translated information to talk to, engage with and accurately represent um, their local um, communities. The final one might be in relation to um, the process of uh, schools allocations, uh, which, which does sort of connect in with the member services. So where there's a challenge to a decision about wh which school a pupil has been allocated to, and there's a language need to make sure that that process is fair, we may need both interpreting and translating. Um, and where that happens, that tends to be for a, a fairly lengthy chunk of time until that, that process of, of complaint and review has been actually completed. OK. So let me just pause before I move on. So that's communities, economy and transport, um, business services and governance services, my areas. Are there any questions um, immediately from everybody before we move on to adult social care? No. OK, there will be time at the end, so it's absolutely fine if something occurs to you later on. So I'm going to pass over to Sarah Murray now um, to take us through the adult social care um, information. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Morning, everybody. Um, so adult social care is very vast, so it would be very impossible for me to share everything that takes place with you today. But I've put the link to our website on this slide. If um, are the slides being sent out, Sarah? They will be, yes. We're going to send Perfect. the slides after so, yeah, so if you're interested, please do have a, a look around on the website just to understand all of the different areas. Um, you might be asked to support with a meeting a client for a safeguarding concern. Another uh, reason why we might make a translation and interpretation request is to help somebody take part in a meeting or attend an event. It might be that it's translating letters to be sent to clients with important information on um, mass mail outs that we often do. So to break down adult social care, Sarah, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, we have four different strands. Um, the first one is operations. That's the most likely strand that you would have a request from. So that includes business and system development team. It includes the older people team, so care homes, the learning disability team, hospitals, um, access to and care management, learning disability and transition service, and it includes our mental health team. So an example of how you might be used in the operations department is undergoing a mental health assessment with a client who does not speak English. Um, the second strand is planning, performance and engagement division. And that area uses translation and interpretation services frequently um, for safer communities, which might be working with drug and alcohol services or domestic abuse services the safeguarding and quality team and inclusion and support services, which is where my team sits. So one example of a request under this team might be translating a public survey into an alternative format to enable more people to take part into BSL, for example, or into various languages for the community that need to respond to that. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the third strand is strategy, commissioning and supply management division. That includes uh, lots of strategic commissioning and mental health and housing, policy and strategic development, um, supply management and learning disability commissioning. So this area, you might require translation and interpretation support to meet with representative groups, for example, for a focus group exercise. Um, the same goes for public health. So their teams might want to consult and engage with the community to find out about um, how they're going to take forward any new initiatives and they would like they would use uh, interpretation and translation services to enable the best engagement with the community. They're much less likely at the moment to use services than those frontline teams that we mentioned previously. Next slide, please, Sarah. 
So the most common requests from adult social care, the majority of your requests are likely to be for face to face interpreting and for interpreting letters and information. Um, for translation, the most common would be leaflets, letters and forms, followed by meetings and surveys. And we also provide um, have providers that are contracted by East Sussex County Council, so they may also use translation and interpretation services with yourselves through this framework. Next slide, thank you. Um, so the process from adult social care is slightly different to the process from children's social care. So in adult social care, you should receive virtually all of your bookings from one particular team, which is the support services admin team. Um, the only exception to that should be out of hours requests. So um, if you're receiving lots of bookings from individuals, then please do feed that back to us because that, that shouldn't be happening unless it's out of hours. Um, if we have a specified time scale in our initial email request, due to the urgency of those requests, we will have to move on and inquire with another provider on the list if we don't receive a response in that time. Um, our booking form does include the space for staff to include important information about the booking and the admin team really do support people to do that well. So, for example, if a client has a mental health condition or a learning disability or there's a particular safeguarding concern and we encourage staff to put um, any kind of keywords that might be needed for that session in that booking form initially. Um, but if you do have any questions from the interpreter um, additional to what's covered in that, then please do ask on those situations. Um, OK, moving on, please, Sarah. So just to give you a bit of a flavour of the adult social care clients that we're working with at the moment, this is as of 28th of February this year, uh, when we had 6,783 clients in total receiving long-term support. So this isn't um, clients that might just be needing us for one piece of equipment, for example, where we might use translation interpretation services. This is just a bit of a snapshot. Um, of those clients, the primary support reason for 72 people was sensory support. So that gives a flavour of some of the interpretation needs and 318 clients were recorded as having a sensory impairment which was formally diagnosed and relevant to their care. So that's quite a number of people that may need BSL interpretation for example. Um, also gives you a bit of a breakdown of the ethnicity of the people that we're working with currently. Obviously that does change as the years go on. Um, but that, that might give us some idea of some of the translation and interpretation needs as well. And moving on again, please. So to give you an idea of the languages and formats that we've requested, um, the top five languages requested in adult social care during 2021 were Bengali, Turkish, Russian, Farsi and Sarani. Um, I've spoken to our translation and interpretation admin team who advised that this can be really changeable because you might have one client, for example, that needs 19 different sessions throughout that year. Um, so that's one client versus could be several different clients that just need that one session. So it can change quite rapidly, which we'll see in the next chart, which gives us the five year average of the uh, languages we've used. These were slightly different top five of Bengali, Sarani, Turkish, Arabic and Polish. Um, I thought that might be helpful in terms of sourcing interpreters and, and the, the languages that we use most frequently. I know Kaveri is planning to come on and ask you in a moment about um, Ukrainian interpretation and Russian, bearing in mind the current news situation, um, but I thought that might be a helpful picture. And our final slide from Adult Social Care is about alternative formats over the last five years. So BSL has been the most requested format, 143 requests or 87 percent of those alternative format requests. And then Deaf Relay followed with 18 requests. Braille and Easy Read were not used frequently, uh, two and one request respectively. Uh, BSL is a request that we often find quite difficult to fulfil in the timescales needed um, due to the lim limited number of BSL interpreters available. So I thought that might be helpful um to give you a picture too i think it's it seems to be um a, an increasing need and uh yeah we often struggle to feel that especially with translation 
for bigger mail outs. Um, that brings me to the end of my little section. I know I wanted to pass over to Kaviri for um, just for her to put some input in. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I found that useful and I hope everybody else did. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everybody here um, for how and, and say how useful it is to um, for you to provide that service to our clients to meet our needs. We do know how much you stretch yourselves and your partners, colleagues and translators and interpreters to meet our needs. So here's a really an opportunity for me to show our gratitude. We uh, we, we can't run without you. We can't. Um, uh, comply with our public sector equality duty or do the work we do without your support. So thank you from uh, from all our teams uh, and do please pass it on to your um, colleagues who do provide the translation and interpretation. One sort of small question since we are gathered together and it doesn't have to be answered today. It could be at the end of the session rather than interpreting the session where we are talking to you about us. Um, is is us, we're trying to understand, as you'll imagine, in the current circumstances, we're trying to set up a home for a Ukrainian scheme as Camp to Council. What do we know about our Ukrainian um, translators, interpreters, as well as Russian, more Ukrainian? You saw the in the chart that Sarah showed earlier, we've had one request in Ukrainian in the last five years. <clears throat> That's going to dramatically change as we have more and more people come to East Sussex from Ukraine and will probably be using our services and we will need interpreters, etc. So any kind of understanding you can give us, uh, and I think this is probably system wide question because they it will be the same people using adult services, children's services um, <clears throat> and various other health, etc. Um, just to gauge an understanding of how many people are we talking about who are interpreters, not the same people who may be employed by different organisations, but if you've got any sense of whether we are prepared or not, and if not, what is it that we can do together uh, to begin to prepare for what's coming ahead for us? And in, there are, as of yesterday, 479 refugees have been mashed to East Sussex. So there's there's going to be a trickle of people coming in. They are already here and they will need our support. So we've got to try and get ready quite soon. Um, so again, just one for you. If you have an answer now or later, it'll be great to hear from you. You can get in touch with any one of us, Sarah Typhoid, myself, Sarah, Murray or Atia. Thank you. Thank you, Kaveri. Thank you, Sarah, as well. Could I suggest that we sort of hold that as a question because I know you've got to go at 11 Kaveri, but it looks like actually we, we may you we may be able to um, pick that up towards the end of the session and, and finish actually before 11. Um, could I suggest that I, we leave that question with you all to have a think about come up with an answer and we go to Atia's presentation about children's services, which may also give you some insight because, of course, you know that there may be uh, relevance there, too. Um, so Atia, I don't know. I think you might be sharing your own slides here up. So I'll hand over to you. Yes, I am. So let me, while I fiddle with the buttons, make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Uh, right, can you see that? And I am going to start. Can you see that? OK, I've got not a lot, I've got yes, about 13 yeah. slides. Yep. So and I will start. So um, Sarah, I can only see you now, of course. Um, which is quite helpful. Um, so if there's a, if anybody else is like interjecting or wants to ask a question, um, please do so and just remind me how much time I have for this. Um, up to about 20 minutes would be great because then we okay. can pick up that question before the end and finish okay. slightly early. So this session, um, Sarah's session is absolutely brilliant. So I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to show you um, any particular data. And that's partly because you will notice that in some of our departments um, do this coordination around the uh, requests for translation in different ways. Um, and adult, adult social care has that central uh, focus, which is really helpful, actually, if we think about it in relation to picking out. Um, and it would take us a little, little bit more time to be able to, to do that. But what I've done is a bit of an amendment and adjustment of a welcome session that we do for our own staff and also for new provider staff as well. Um, and I've sort of tailored that really for your purposes. So first of all, you know, we're talking about children's services. Got a lovely picture here of children 
uh, and young people, and it's exactly what it is. Our service is focused around children, young people, but also families. So you don't see parents and carers in this in this image here, but actually when, when I start talking through the different services, a lot of it is about support to parents and carers. So this, the, the senior leadership team um, showing you, if I can move, oh, I can, I can move Sarah up there. Um, I don't know if you can see the four smiling faces along the side. So they are really um, the leads for each of our four areas. And I think that's often helpful for you to get a sense of the titles, but they putting names to faces. So we have a new director, um, Alison Jeffrey. So obviously she has an overview of the department. And then we've got the three leads um, and you can see in their title, you've got early health and social care, Kathy, Elizabeth on education, Lou on communications, planning and assessment. And I sit as the equality, participation and partnerships lead in Lou's division. So and I'll talk through what those mean. But actually, if you already look at those job titles, you can get a sense of early health and social care. So that is very much that um, non-statutory, I suppose it's in the sense if I want to describe it in, in um, uh, non-statutory language, it's the services that uh, children and families voluntarily engage in. And so it's we're supporting families earlier, whether it's around child protection, whether it's around being on edge of care, whether it's being uh, known to our um, police or health colleagues around being on the lower levels of requiring more acute support. That's what that service is all about, really supporting children and families at an earlier stage so that there is no need for them to escalate up the continuum of need, which is a phrase, and I will describe that in a few slides. So, and then in relation to education, um, we don't manage schools, and then that, this is an important distinction. We don't manage schools, uh, but we are responsible for supporting, advising, and guiding them, where we are actually statutorily responsible for doing what are called the forecasting around the numbers of places. So making that match between what the population is telling us and then working with the Department of Education around school places, you know, potentially opening new classes, um, you know, extending year groups, but also potentially um, making case for new schools in particular localities if there's an influx or a change in population. But this work is very much about supporting um, schools and colleges. And, and it says education here, but there's a lot here where you might well be also involved in supporting. So, for example, our educational psychology service comes under here and they support our schools and colleges uh, in relation to um, individual assessments for children and young people. And that's where a school might have a young person who is, um, they feel that they would like to have them assessed around additional um, needs in relation to education, health and care plan. And our educational psychologists would be working for them. But in fact, it is the school who would have the responsibility for securing that interpreter. So again, it's a bit of a plea around um, we work alongside schools, we're supporting, advising them, and sometimes schools may not be fully aware of their responsibilities. Um, and that's where we would really be saying to them, actually, yes, if this is a family where English is additional language, you have a duty to procure that and to make sure it's available. And this is where we would then say to them, and we have a lovely list of preferred providers um, for, for you to, to um, work with and, and choose from. Um, another example within that um, section, and this is the fun section, is around uh, working to support actually pupils with the English as additional language. So we do have an internal service, um, but actually there may be times when the support, our, our, our EEL service, English as additional language service, might find that that support to that young person is slightly morphing into other things, social care, 
uh, or mental health. And that's where they would say, actually, this isn't about, um, you know, we don't have the capacity to support. We need to bring in the interpreter provider. And then Lou, of course, sitting in there, I sit within that. She has the lead for the sort of, I would say, um, that strategic support around a best practice, improvement, the equality agenda sits in there, but also our planning um, and performance. And again, we where we might be working with you is we also have the holiday activity and food program sits there. There might be young people there who, or their families who might need additional support. And that's where we would be um, you know, looking to the interpreter providers. So let me see, why is this not moving along? OK, so I remember I just talked about the continuum of need earlier. So this is very much a, I suppose, a dial that we use. It's something that was developed. Some of you will be familiar with this. I see some familiar faces on when we first did the introductions, but some of you will be new to this. And often our professionals, particularly in early help and social care who are working directly with um, families will be talking about, OK, does this child or young person sit within level one, level two, level three or level four? Um, and if you can see this essentially to try and make. Put this in very simplistic uh, language, which Sarah used to be in children's services would probably describe this much better than I, is that essentially we're talking about level one, the sort of universal, and again, that's another language people use, universal meaning everybody. Everybody has, uh, is probably going to sit within that level one. And as you go round the dial to the other levels, level two, right, this child might be needing a little bit more support. They might be being uh, supported by the English as additional language service or um, our educational psychology service might be working with them on an, on an assessment. Then we're moving along to the early help, and that's where the issues have become a bit more uh, complex. There might be family issues around um, parents being um, known to uh, community safety colleagues. Um, there might be uh, parents where there are issues around mental health difficulties or learning difficulties. Uh, or the child, the young person themselves are experiencing these, but they're not quite at the level where a we have got a sort of full child protection plan, or that the child has become looked after, or that we or that the child is getting really acute uh, CAMS service from the NHS, which is child and adolescent mental health support. And then that would move into level four. So why I'm showing you this is that often this is language that our practitioners use. And, you know, it's pretty much jargon, but they're very much used to it. And my uh, plea to you would be to ask. So if you're hearing that in um, the, the in that inter in that interpreting interpretation context, and obviously you are there and you're not there as an advocate, but in order to really be able to translate well, I would um, say, you know, you could absolutely ask for an explanation of that. So that's clearer to the client as well. And then level four, as I said, it's very much those acute needs um, where there's more uh, protection. So, um, Sarah, I can't even see my clock now. So tell me how long I have now. About another 10 minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then sort of at the bottom, you'll see there's the sort of advice, guidance and, and support. And I think this is where I'm saying that you've got the universal, the universal plus, the universal partnership plus, meaning then with others and then safeguarding. So there are other sorts of languages that people, other terms that people are using. Level one is more universal. Level two, that universal plus. Um, level three, and you can see slightly at the bottom, universal partnership plus sort of working with others. And then the, the yellow uh, level four, where we're absolutely it is about safeguarding and the child is probably being taken into care. Let's see if this is working. It's not working as I'm trying to take it along. Right, so um, 
Chin CP Black. I'm going to actually ask uh, Sarah if um, do people know what these mean? See if anybody's got a hand up. OK, is there anyone who wants to hazard a guess at what these mean? Uh, Aaron. Uh, well, lack is looked after child. Um, CP is child protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would imagine Chin is child in need. Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. Um, and in a sense, um, these connect to the levels. So um, probably level two, three and four. So a child in need would be in level two. So needing a little bit a bit more support. CP, they've probably got a child protection um, plan. So that's level three. And then LAP, looked after child, they would have they would be in level four in terms of really a big having come into care. So again, people use these quite a lot. Sometimes they say CHIN, sometimes they say SIN, CP, LAC. Again, they're, they're acronyms are really useful for you um, to know and be familiar with. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and this is uh, a bit more detail, uh, which is illustrating. Oh, dear. I, am I still sharing? Because I've disappeared now. Now, here we are. So in terms of child in need, so this is useful for you for you to know because really in terms of children's services this is where the majority of our interpretation need is it's around support to our our children within the social care process um, and I, I will definitely I could share these with you so you have them to hand as well but it's sort of there are some there is a whole um sense of of um legal definition or behind that term terminology often our, our staff will talk about oh they are section 17 child or they're section 47 child and you'll see then there that what that connects to so when you're a child in need section 17 of the children act has come into play in that we have duties as a local authority to safeguard and promote um, that child and a child in need plan can be produced. Child protection section 47. Um, actually, now we are at, we are saying we <clears throat> we need to take this further. We need to do an inquiry. We need to <laughs> understand uh, whether any action should be taken to safeguard the child. And often in those uh, sessions, those meetings. And often they are with um, the child and family. Uh, it that's where we would be calling upon interpreters to make sure that the child and the young person and family is absolutely clear about what is actually happening. And then the looked after child. So this would be happening if the Section 47 inquiry deemed that the child can't remain with their current carers. Um, and then they would be either three options for them, living with foster parents, living in a residential children's home, or living in a residential unit, such as a such as a sort of special school, um, often around supporting uh, where the, ch the child needs more support with their emotional and behaviour needs, or secure units where there are concerns around criminal exploitation. Um, I'm going to. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't work very well, but here you are. Hang on a second. I didn't realize this was a film and I haven't put my sound on. So what I'm going to do is pass this over because I don't think we really have time. But please, when you get these slides, uh, please to have a look at it, because this is actually a really great little short video. Um, another thing to say before I leave you is that what, how we practice in East Sussex is this methodology called connected practice, particularly around supporting children's social care. And why I am um, mentioning this is that it's really important for you as interpreter, interpretation providers to understand that there is a sort of framework around those a real impetus, a real desire to create those meaningful relationships with children and families. So obviously 
notwithstanding the equality duty, a lot of that is going to be about making sure that the children and families are working with really understand, and particularly in your case, both in terms of BSL and other lang uh, um, other spoken languages in, or in order to really engage in that process. Um, they need to really understand it. Um, these are a few slides that, um, again, I'll send you through, Sarah, but I was talking earlier about the sorts of services. So similar to the slides that Sarah Ty Ford showed around the, the different divisions, we can see these are a number of um, services that may be contacting you for um, interpreter or translation support. So the schools, partnerships and governance you might think, well, that's very much sort of policy focus. There might be a need where um, uh, a family within who is being supported by English and additional language service wants um, some documents translated, which we haven't translated on file. So we very much respond to need as it arises. And all the others very much you can see safeguarding, special educational needs, inclusion, educational psychology, children's disability. We will, of course, have children and families both in terms of BSL or other languages who will need our support and we will need our interpreting providers to support with that. Uh, and I'm going to, this is another video, but I'm going to go through it because I haven't got time. Um, and finally to say that um, I want to leave you with this slide around equality, diversity and inclusion. As Kaveri was saying, we have a duty to make sure that we're abiding by those three um, elements within the equality duty eliminating discrimination, seeking opportunities to advance equality of opportunity and fostering good relations. And under that, we've got a number of plans. But this work, working with you, is really, really crucial um, to, to ensure and demonstrate that we're meeting our equality duty. And I will leave that sort of generally to Q&A and I will now escape. And lovely to talk to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Atia. Bang on time as well. Um, that's brilliant. Um, so I've noticed that there are a couple of questions in the chat. I've also noticed that a couple of people have posted some links to uh, their, their work and their plans in relation to Ukraine. Let me just go back to, so that for the recording, we've actually got the, so the, the last slide with the um, contact details on and then I'll bring it back to questions. Um, so just to say uh, our contact details as i said we'll circulate these slides uh we'll add atia's in so that there's just one and then we'll circulate a link to where you can find the, the whole video once we've sorted out the transcriptions and we'll just tidy up the transcription a bit but basically the three main contacts will be uh me if it's whole council or any of my three directorates communities economy and transport business or governance services for adult social care, I think the best point of contact at the moment is Sarah Murray and for children's services, it's, it's Atia, um, as, as she's just described. Um, and it only remains for me to say thank you so much for your for your attention uh, and we'll deal with the questions now, I think, um, and suggest that we look at the answers to the Ukraine question that Kaveri uh, posed, but also I see that there are two questions in the chat which we'll come back to. So I will stop the recording now and just say thank you very much for this part of the session.